Captain's Log. Start at 170205. How's everyone doing? Uh, I'd be better if the Falcons were playing the Colts today. But, or, yeah, today. But, it is what it is, you know. When you got a general manager that can't draft to save his ass, it is what it is. Hey, you know what? I'm a bandwagon Falcons fan today. I will, I will, I will proudly admit that. I'll show you my badge here in a minute, as I'm playing the theme off of my phone. That's the only way I can get it to work and balance out just right. But hey, hang on. So, that being said, let's get to today's sponsor. Sponsor for this entry. Our friends over at Live Long and Prosper, the Facebook page, commanded by Captain Christine Hope, is following, inspiring all around the world for peace and long life. Keep in mind, your mind matter. And you know what? That basically tells me if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I am down with that. That's how I was raised. Too bad other people weren't raised that way. Hey, I've got the official Screw the Patriots hat on right now. Patriots suck right there. Go Falcons. We're Falcons fans at our station Okinawa today. And hopefully anybody watching Prosper is too. I can think of one that isn't. But hey, it is what it is. Hey, while I'm thinking about it, it turns out that last week, last week, I forgot to upload Prosper. I forgot to upload Prosper. So I'm working on that right now. As I mentioned last week, I did some retooling. Still in the middle of it. Still doing retooling. You know, I was going to see what everybody thought about it, but to my surprise, kind of, I didn't get any responses then. So, with that being said, I'm still in the middle of retooling. Atlanta Falcons, rise up. Super Bowl 51, the official hype video, rise up, beat the cheaters, that's it, so as I said earlier, I've got an official badge that clears me for this week, actually, yeah, it clears me for this week, one day volunteer pass event, Super Bowl 51. Augmentee's job, Atlanta Falcons fans. The text right there is too little, so I'll read it verbatim. It says, Disclaimer, this pass entitles the bearer, the diehard fan of their specification, go Colts, the ability to cheer against the New England Patriots just for the sake of their loss. This in no way, shape, or form decreases the diehard fans' loyalty to their own team. Once Super Bowl 51 has concluded, all bets are off. Diehard fans are released of their duty to return back to their team of choice and shall incur no retribution or wrath for doing such an honorable deed. That pass was put together by my friend Dan Butler. Dan, my friend, my brother, even though you and I don't always see eye to eye and you're, we both look at each other as kind of weird, kind of off. Hey, you know what? You done good, Pilgrim. You done good. Oh. Do it this hand. I give you the prosper salute, my friend. I would drink to you, but I haven't even I haven't even replicated the beverages of choice yet. So let's make that happen, shall we? This week's beverage of choice. Cold. Ooh. Something I haven't drank yet. Gave me two of them, just in case. Orion Mugishukunin. Yeah, I don't know what the hell that says. I don't know what the hell that means. But it's 5.5% alcohol. Here's the proper beer opening device. Right into a good consumption device. My Indianapolis Colts beer mug, which was a gift given to me by my dear friend over beer and song of the day, Josh Baker. Which, by the way... Hey, prick, when are you going to send my stuff out? Can't give you too much crap. 
Can't give you too much crap. After all, I only did say it last week on Prosper, but I didn't get uploaded. So I'm working on it right now. Kapla! Ah, it's pretty good. All right. Got past the sponsor. Now we're about ready to go into the data banks. I'm still tool I'm still retooling it. Still retooling it, looking for some honest feedback. This week's episode this week's entry, Elon of Troyus. Spoiler alert. Alrighty. So as I said, this one's called Elon of Troyus. Here we go. Captain's log, start date 4732, or excuse me, 4372.5. On a top secret diplomatic mission, the Enterprise has ordered the Telen star system. Maintaining communications blackout, we have taken aboard Petri, ambassador from Troyes, the outer planet, and are now approaching the inner planet, Elas. Disgruntled by the cloak and dagger orders cut by a desk bound Starfleet bureaucrat, <laughs> no, that one goes. Kirk, Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Scotty prepare to welcome the Elasian members of the mission. Kirk still doesn't know the details of the task he is about to perform. The secrecy is apparently called for because the Telen system is in the vicinity. Excuse, excuse me. Is in the vicinity of the Federation Klingon border. Scientists who first reported on Elas called the men vicious and arrogant, the women very special with a subtle, mystical power that drives men wild. Petri, the somewhat fussy Trojan ambassador, says the next step is to pick up the Dolmen, the person most feared and hated by the Trojans. The Dolmen is a small woman, Elon, the ruler of Elas, who commands the absolute who commands absolute obedience. She is accompanied by a group of huge, powerful men who wear body armor and carry nuclear hand weapons. Woo! Petri now explains to Kirk that the Dolmen is to be given away in an arranged marriage to the ruler of Troyes. The two, the two worlds now possess the capability of mutual destruction, and it is hoped that the marriage will symbolically unite the worlds and bring peace. His own job is to teach her more refined, civilized manners, so the Enterprise must pr proceed back to Troyes at the slowest speed possible. <laughs> Aft thrusters, Mr. Sulu. <laughs> Almost immediately, Kirk is summoned to Elon's quarters, actually Uhura's, by the news that she is dissatisfied with them. Kirk arrives to find Elon throwing a fit. Petri is there, trying to placate her with wedding gifts, a pair of embroidered slippers, a shimmering blue glown, gown, and an antique folk art necklace he calls the most prized of royal jewels for your lovely neck. His reluctance is very obvious despite his veneer. She wants nothing of Troyes or what she considers his soft, servile customs, but Kirk tells her she'll have to put up with them if she is to fulfill her obligations. Asking Kirk if he is responding to her complaints about Uhura's quarters, the captain suggests that she will have to get comfortable there comfortable here when told this elon prepares to throw a pillow around and kirk responds there are no there are no more available but if that's the only way you can get gratification i'll arrange to have the whole room filled from floor to ceiling with breakable objects in a corridor outside elon's quarters petri insists to kirk that he hates the elasians and cannot complete his task for elon is impossibly arrogant and violent Trojan males had been described in these terms earlier, and we also hear Elon denounce female trappings as offensive, saying she is not a soft fawn to need pillows to sit on. Petri still insists that there cannot be peace between Elasians and Trojans, since when he is around them, he wants to kill them. In response to Petri insisting that Elon will not listen to him, Kirk suggests that he stop being so diplomatic and instead deal with her in a strong, straightforward manner. Spock reports what looks like a censored ghost, excuse me, but can't be since all his equipment at his station is working perfectly. 
so it must instead be a spaceship. Kirk suggests that it might be a hydrogen cloud reflection, but Spock notes that the Enterprise is not near any in the area. Again, Kirk is summoned away from the bridge, this time to engineering, where Elon and her personal guard are looking around and fiddling with the controls. <sighs> she expresses disdain for the crew trying to give her a tour and ex an explanation of engineering, await wanting only to know how the ship is used in combat. Scott is quick to point out that the engines are considered crucial in combat. Kirk tells her she should be more courteous, but she says courtesy is not for inferiors. What a bitch. Oh, I said it out loud. No sooner have Kirk, Spock, and Sulu determined that the ghost is in fact a Klingon warship than Kirk is summoned again to Elon's room. He finds Petri laying, a, laying in a pool of blood with a dagger embedded in his back. Petri will recover, but he renounces his mission and wants absolutely nothing further to do with Kirk. On top of everything else, the Federation High Commissioner is on his way to Troyes for the wedding. Asked by Nurse Chapel why any man would want an, El an Elysian bride if they act like this, Petri explains that it is biochemical. Any man whose skin is touched by the tears of an Elysian woman immediately falls in love with her. Forever. Kirk explains the mission to Elon in terms of military discipline. While she sits there eating like a barbarian and drinking right from the bottle of saurian brandy. With no table manners whatsoever. She reiterates that she despises Troyans and will not go through with the wedding. Kirk states that he'll teach her basic etiquette himself. Meanwhile, Crichton sneaks into engineering and performs acts of sabotage of the dilithium crystals. Watson, an engineer, catches him in the act and Crichton kills him by snapping his neck. When Kirk tries to visit Elon again, he is kept out by her guards, but he had the forethought to bring Spock, who phaser stuns the guards long enough to let Kirk in. Again, Elon throws a fit, but Kirk yells right back at her and demands that, he accept, that she accept the order she's been given as laid out by the Elysian and Troyan councils. <sighs> Letting some of his own irritation with councils, rulers, and bureaucrats creep into his lecture. <sighs> Elon decides there's one thing she can trust Kirk with. She worries that nobody likes her. As she talks about this, she cries, and Kirk wipes her tears away, not having heard Petri's earlier warning in sickbay. It is not clear whether Elon has done this on purpose or whether she's genuinely unhappy. Perhaps both. In any case, the two soon embrace and make love. <sighs> Sometime later, Kirk is paged by Uhura, who's found a tight beam radio transmission to the Klingon vessel coming from within engineering. Kirk orders intruder alert, and that security report directly to engineering on the double. It is discovered to have come from Crichton, the chief of Elon's guards, using a Klingon communicator. Just before he's caught by the engineering officer, he promptly murdered. Kirk questions him about his sabotage, <coughs> excuse me, and his involvement with the Klingons, but Crichton will not talk, and he states he is conditioned against responding. <coughs> to any physical torture to make him talk. Kirk calls Spock to engineering to perform a Vulcan mind probe on him. Crichton kills himself by self-vaporization. Scott checks various relays for sabotage. Kirk returns to Elon, who tells him that Crichton loved her and had acted out of jealousy. Kirk wonders why the Klingons would care about disrupting the wedding. Excuse me. But Elon is unconcerned and welcomes the interference. She suggests that he uses the ship's power to completely obliterate Troyes and be rewarded by the Elysians, but, will, but his will and ethics are too strong for that. This is something she can admire and understand. Judging by Elon's much gentler behavior, it seems that the bond affects the women as well as the men. She seems to now genuinely care for and respect Kirk as an equal. After being reluctantly called out of Elon's quarters by McCoy and Spock, Kirk finds out about Elysian tears and demands that McCoy find an antidote. <laughs> Excuse me. 
<sighs> the Klingon ship prepares to attack. Scott discovers a bomb has been rigged to the engines to set off if the ship goes to warp. Kirk manages to bluff their way out of the attack, observed by Elon, who has followed him to the bridge, standing near the turbo lift. He asks her to go to sickbay, as it is the safest part of the ship, reminding her that he must still take her to Troyes. While in sickbay, she encounters Petri, who again offers the wedding necklace and speaks, sincerely and without frills, of the hope for peace between their worlds. <clears throat> Scott manages to dismantle the bomb, but finds the dilithium crystal converter assembly has been fused, meaning the ship couldn't go to warp anyhow or power up the phaser banks. They must have replacement crystals. If they contact Starfleet, they would alert the Klingons to their vulnerability. The Klingon captain calls for their unconditional surrender. <sighs> Excuse me. Kirk manages some slow but impressive tactical maneuvers as the Klingon ship approaches and fires. Again, Elon appears on the bridge in her wedding outfit, thinking they're about to die. <sighs> Spock picks up unusual energy readings and finds they're coming from her necklace, which is strung with uncut dilithium crystals. <laughs> she explains that the white beads are common stones called radams, and that the necklace is of little value other than its traditional meaning of good fortune. Excuse me. Klingon and Federation interest in the system is now clear, and Elon gladly donates the necklace for Scotty to reactivate the engines. Her words, if I can be of any help, of course, prove that she was aware of the common courtesy all along. The Klingon captain offers one last chance to surrender as he points out the Enterprise is draining its reserves and shields are buckling. Stalling for time, Kirk requests protection of Elon as a condition for surrender. The Klingon captain refuses and reiterates its unconditional surrender demand. Spock and Scott finish the installation of the crystals, while Kirk orders that Ensign Chekhov have the photon torpedoes armed and ready. Explaining his strategy to the bridge crew, he prepares a full spread of torpedoes at the Klingons. The crude shape of the crystals cause power fluctuations, but the Enterprise manages to power up and restore its shields. Kirk orders warp maneuvers and, pi and pivots at warp 2. The Klingons fire on the Enterprise, but exposes their, their aft to her. Seizing the attack of opportunity, Kirk orders photon torpedoes fired, Excuse me, scoring a direct hit to the Klingons' midship. Spock reports significant damage to the Klingon shields, while Chekhov says the ship is badly damaged and is withdrawing at reduced speed. Kirk orders that Sulu resume course to Troyes, while Elon doesn't understand why he won't pursue and finish off the crippled Klingons. Later in the transporter room, as Elon prepares to beam down for the wedding, she invites Kirk, but he won't come. She presents him with her dagger, saying that on Troyes, they don't carry personal weapons. <clears throat> Openly weeping, she mounts the transporter platform and dematerializes. On the bridge, McCoy tells Spock that he has finally found a possible antidote but Kirk is already apparently back to normal. And Spock says the Enterprise had captured Kirk's, Kirk's heart long before the Dolman did. Aw, how cute. How very cute indeed. So with that said, let's jump around a little bit. Let's jump around just a hair. Let's go back to our birthdays. First birthday I want to get to from this past week. A buddy of mine, I worked with him and I worked with him when I was living in Off Deutschland. The outstanding, the awesome X-ray tech Vernon Nelson. What's going on, brother? How you doing? How's life treating you? Hope things go well for you. I hope to, I hope I get the chance to run into you someday. But hey, if not, let's drink here. Next on the list, I knew this lovely lady. Back in back in the days when I was in when I was in high school, <laughs> I don't know what the hell I was trying to say there. Knew her in high school. She was a part of she was a part of the color guard in the marching band. Victoria Lewis. I knew her under a different name, but Vicky, what's up? How you doing? 
How are things going for you? I hope life's treating you well. I really do. Hope things are going good for you. Hey, go Falcons, right? Next on the list. Now, I met this guy in a Star Trek group. I have actually yet to meet him in person, but I do understand he has him a high-profile job here as of late. I, My friend Lawrence Kelly, I, I forget what your job is right now, but I hope you're doing good. I hope you're excelling. I hope you're prospering at your new job. I hope things are going well for you, and I hope you had a happy birthday. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, next on the list, it's ooh, it's late here. It's almost ten o'clock here, or twenty-two hundred, I should say. Next on the list, I know this guy here, Earth Station Okinawa. Outstanding dude. He's an awesome ranger, Jeremy Aldaco. What's going on, man? How you doing? I hope you had a good birthday. Hope you celebrated well, lived it up, partied hard, kicked some ass, took some names, killed commies for mommy. Hey, this is for you, my friend. Next on the list. Excuse me. I actually met this. I actually met this cat. Going on. Was it 18 years ago? Has it really been that long? My friend Ray Vicchetti. Now he actually did. He actually did some Photoshop work for my friend over at Beer and Song of the Day. He took an image of. He actually took an image of Josh. And put it on Deep Space Nine's view screen and made it look like. The shot I sent Ray from Ops on Deep Space Nine made it look like a bunch of people were watching Beer and Song of the Day. And my friend Josh was actually tickled to death about it. My friend Ray, good stuff, good dude. I hope this finds you well. Next on the list. Now, I knew this gal. I met her shortly after I met my house commander, Robin. I met her out camping. Her and her husband. I'm talking about Eva Sturgill. Is it Eva or Ava? I think it's Eva. But hey, how you doing? I hope this finds you well. I hope you're doing good. Hanging in there. Living life. Knowing you, I'm sure you are. But hey, this one's for you. <sighs> Next on the list. Now, I actually met this guy here. He's moved on. He is... I want to say you're living in Mississippi. I want to say that. Don't quote me on that. I'm talking about John Zentner. What's going on, my friend? How you doing? I hope this finds you well. I hope you had a good birthday. I hope you got spoiled. And hey, this is for you. <sighs> Moving on. Moving on. Got three more. Uh, the first, This first one. First one, actually, my house commander's cousin, my sweet cousin, Kathy Tracy. Kathy, what's going on? How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. I really do. I hope this finds you well, doing good. And hey, this is for you. All right, next on the list. I've yet to meet this guy in person, but he's about as hardcore of a Colts fan as I am. I'm talking about Darvell Smith Sr., Darvell, my friend, what is up? How you doing? Are you rooting for the Falcons like I am, or are you just saying to hell with it since the Colts aren't in there? I mean, it's still football. I'm a I'm a Patriots hater, as you can obviously tell. You have to be a Colt. You have to be a Patriots fa Patriots hater to be a Colts fan. At least in my book, you do. Um, well, what else was I gonna say? Oh, I've got some stuff coming up here in a little bit. You might want to you might want to hang on for, but Darvell. I hope you're rooting for the Falcons like I am. And if you just don't give a shit now, hey, I can live with that too. If it were another if it were another AFC team that weren't the Colts or the Broncos, because yeah, I still got a soft spot for the Broncos, I'd probably I'd probably be I'd probably have your mindset too. It's like, eh, whatever. But hey. Excuse me. And last but not least. This gal was a bridesmaid at my wedding back over 10 years ago. My dear sweet friend, Abby Hayden. Abby, what's going on? How you doing? I hope this finds you well. Hope you're doing okay. If you need anything, hit me up. Let me know. I'm here for you.
Hey, this is for you. That's it for the birthdays. Now, I mentioned him earlier. My friend Josh over at Beard Song of the Day. Big diehard Patriots fan. Cheaters fan. I hope you're crying tomorrow after the game. But hey, you know what? If you're crying, I'll be the first one to buy you a beer. If you ain't crying, chances are I am. Because that means that the team I hate the most, those undeserving, arrogant, cheating bastards, stole another Super Bowl from, a, from another deserving team. But hey, don't worry about that. It ain't going to affect us any. Hey, dude, where's my stuff? I know I asked you a week ago, but I didn't post it, but I forgot to post the video. Sorry, man. I ain't perfect. If I were perfect, I'd be working at NASA. Hey, here's to you. And now I know there are two people. I know there are two people who are going to be watching the Super Bowl tomorrow not rooting for the for the Patriots, or as I call them, the cheaters. My friend James Wheeler, Derek Porch. Now, Wee Wee, I know him here. I was actually supposed to watch the Super Bowl with him tomorrow. Tomorrow over at Cheers, but man, I, I had something come up. I really did. I really did. I want you to see it in my eyes, but I really, I really did have something come up, and I had to back out. And man, I tell you what, my offer still stands though. If you need me, call me. I'll hook you up. I'll take care of you. And Derek Porch, I have yet to meet him in person, but he's a diehard Falcons fan. I hope the Falcons are finally able to win a Super Bowl. I really do. Go Falcons. All right. Now, I didn't mention football. It's time for my prediction. This is going to be very hard. This is a very this is going to be a very hard one to predict. Because one team has actually made it here. They've actually deserved it after years of being dry. Actually, no, scratch it. Yeah, it was years after their last Super Bowl appearance. The other teams are cheaters. But I do hope I do hope Atlanta does defy the odds. All the odds are against them. All everybody's betting on New England, which yeah, I don't know. It's it's a tough one to predict. After seeing both teams play, this game could go either way. But I am gonna throw it out there. My prediction: the Atlanta Falcons are gonna win their first Super Bowl. I'm going with it. I don't have a score. I'm not in the middle of a contest. So I am not going to predict a score, which reminds me, I showed it off last week, but the show didn't make it up last week. So let me do it again. I got to do this. As you all know, I was in a uh, pick em contest with my friend Josh Baker over Beer and Song of the Day. Now, this, this picture isn't from the actual show that he was supposed to wear this on, but he did honor his bet because... He lost the contest. The loser had to wear the winning, the winner's colors, which he did. And kudos to him. I give him the prosper salute on that one, and I will drink to him for holding up his end of the bet. But we're going to do it again next year. We're going to do it again next year, starting at week one. And we're going to have all the kinks worked out of it, too. <laughs> In other news, the bad news. Pat McAfee has retired. 29 years old. He retired. This is like his third surgery in four years on his knees. I think this time it was on his kicking knee. He just couldn't take it anymore. He called it quits. Pat, my friend. Now, I actually met Pat McAfee about it, almost a year ago here at Earth Station, Okinawa. He and five others, including Chuck Pagano, we're on a tour, and this was one of their stops. If I, I've got the picture. Hold tight. I've got the picture. That was an awesome day. That was probably – that was – I got married before I graduated Starfleet Academy, but this was the best day since I graduated the academy. Pat McAfee, Mike Adams, myself, Chuck Pagano, my wife, the house commander – Anthony Costanzo and Dequel Jackson. All right there. Came and saw us. Good dudes. 
all class act, very down to earth guys. I wish I had the opportunity to do it again. I really do. But hey, Pat, I wish you the best of luck in your retirement. I really do. I hope I hope everything works out for you. And just know, I'd I'd be willing to bet I'd be willing to bet my left testicle on this, but if you wanted if you decided you wanted to go back, I am very certain the Colts would sign you again. I really am. Okay, so that's the bad. Good news is Jim Merce finally popped his head out of his ass and fired Ryan Grigson. About four years too late, in my opinion. Hey, you know what? He's the man with the checkbook. He's the one making the decisions for the Indianapolis Colts. He let Ryan Grigson go about freaking time. And in his place, as the new general manager at Indianapolis, um, Chris Ballard, I think that's his name, I want to say he was the like the vice president of football operations for the Chiefs, which I know that kind of upsets that, that upsets George George Sackman and Becky Holmquist. I know those two are upset about that, but hey, you know what? We need all we can get. You guys, the, the Chiefs have rebuilt. They've made leaps and bounds. Excuse me. They've done good. Held the number two seed this year postseason. They've done good. And I'm honestly glad we got somebody, from what I understand, Chris Ballard, very good. Understand Ballard is very good. I hope that holds true for Indianapolis. I really do. If so, Patriots are going to be scared one day. Here's to it. All right. Talk football this week in Trek history. I only have one entry. I only have one thing to bring up. Brent Spiner, the man who played Lieutenant Commander Data, born February 2nd, 1949. Am I, my, am I reading my handwriting right? Yes. Turned 68. Outstanding. That is all I've got on that. But with that being said, let me check something. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go behind the scenes. This is the only episode in the franchise to have both been to have been both fully written and directed by the same person, John Meredith Lucas, I think was his name. I think, yeah. Did you know that? I did not. <clears throat> this episode takes its title. This episode's title is a take on Helen of Troy, and yeah, John Meredith Lucas. In fact, Lucas's story outline was entitled Helen of Troyus. Another woman whose marriage can lead to war. The story is a science fiction version of Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew, and Anthony and Cleopatra. The first draft script was delivered 16 May 1968. The final revised draft script submitted 27 May. And the episode was filmed late May, early June. Excuse me. McCoy again asked Spock, are you out of your Vulcan mind? before his act of self-sacrifice in Star Trek II of the Wrath of Khan. This line even transcends timelines, as McCoy, played by Carl Urban, said it to Spock, Zachary Quinto, in the 2009 film Star Trek. I remember that. I think, I think it was that play, I think it was that interplay between Urban and Quinto that sold me on those two. No, I scratched that. I was sold on Quinto before that, but it was that interplay that sold Urban on me. It really was. A scene with Spock playing his Vulcan harp in the Arboretum set was filmed, but then edited out. In that scene, he indicated that he had lost an all-Vulcan musical competition to his father. <laughs> the music was supposed to be fed into the Dolman's computer to calm her down. Removal of this scene meant that the new Arboretum would only be seen on screen twice in the episodes And the Children Shall Lead and in redressed form in Is There In Truth No Beauty. <clears throat> the script portion of the edited scene, as well as stills from it, can be viewed here by clicking the link. Which, yeah, find it. you'll have to find it on Memory Alpha to find that page. <sighs> the scene is in the James Blish novelization also. The pocketbook, pocketbook's novel Firestorm excuse me, was written as a sequel to the episode and deals with what became of Elon after her marriage on Troyes. 
Scotty later referred to the events of this episode, specifically mentioning the Dolmen of Elas and relics. Presidential candidate Robert Kennedy was assassinated during the filming of this episode. France Wynn, or Nyan, N-U-Y-A-N, however you pronounce it, a big supporter of Kennedy, had been deeply shocked by the news while shooting her parts as Elon. <clears throat> the Dolmen of Elas undergoes more costume changes than any other original series character, with the exception of Barbara Anderson, Lenore Caridian, in the, in the Conscience of the King, and Ricardo Montalban, Khan Noonien Singh, in Space Scene. Guest star France Nyan's costumes are more off, or far more revealing than Barbara Anderson's. However, the purple and silver halter top and attached shorts, the silver flower breast and groin shields on black mesh, the orange dress, and the blue wedding gown with no sides. The armor of Elon's guards were constructed out of red and orange pl plastic placemats. The incomplete body armor worn by Tony Young played Crichton, was sold in Christie's 40 Years of Star Trek, The Collection, auction for $800. The security officers on the ship have new belts in the third season. They are wide, black, and warm around the uniform top at the midriff rather than under the tunic at the hip. In the Savage Curtain, the belts are seen white for Lincoln's Honor Guard. Vinci's uniform bears the stripes of a lieutenant commander in this episode, whoever the hell that is. The, episodes pre the episode preview's visual effects differ from that of the finished episode. In the preview, the Klingon ship's photon torpedoes are white. In the episode, they are bright green. Mm -mm -mm. Oh well. This was one of only two episodes, with Errand of Mercy, that showed a Klingon flip-top communicator similar to the ones used by Starfleet. This communicator was originally seen as an Emenian one in the episode A Taste of Armageddon. The Saurian brandy container makes an appearance in this episode. The bottle is actually a George Dickel commemorative, commemorative edition power horn whiskey bottle. I kind of wish I had one of those now. This episode marks the first appearance of the Matt Jeffries designed Klingon ship, previously seen at as a completely unfamiliar animated blob in Friday's Child. The new emblem of the Klingon Empire is seen on the model and in the background of the Klingon Bridge, but aligned differently to the norm. Similarly to the Corbomite maneuver, this episode was filmed early in the season, but aired much later because of the many newly created special effects shots which took a lot of time to be filmed and added in post-production. Day of the Dove, which was filmed later but aired earlier, reused shots of the Klingon battlecruiser from this episode. The blue planet used for Troyus is the same one used for Scalos and Wink of an Eye in Argelius II and Wolf in the Fold. Scotty is shown <laughs> applying Elon's Radans. In fact, raw dilithium crystals for power conversion use. <laughs> Excuse me. In a different converter assembly. A pop up articulation frame mounted within the top part of the warp core casing itself, than the one depicted in the alternative factor. This is probably most properly viewed as less a continuity error than a depiction of Scotty improvising a miracle due to the urgency of the situation depicted in Elon of Troyes. <laughs> the effect of the irregular shape of the crystals is observed in dialogue as being a random factor potentially affecting the probability of success. The top of the warp core mounted dilithium crystal converter articulation frame seen in Elon of Troyes contains probably what Starfleet engineers would refer to as a Jesus crystal. A last line of failure defense, suggesting the possibility of a redesign to omit the bypass circuits mentioned in Mud's Women. Excuse me. And a total dependence on dilithium power for a total dependence on dilithium for power conversion by this point in the series. Given the multi-crystal power conversion assembly and monitoring stations seen earlier in the alternative factor. Alternatively, the top of the warp core mounted dilithium crystal converter articulation frame seen here 
may constitute the bypass circuits to which Scotty referred as being fused beyond usability in the earlier MUDS women. In any event, the known importance of the function of and the pluralized references to dilithium crystals observed in several storylines suggests the canonality of the multi-crystal power conversion assembly and monitoring stations seen earlier in the alternative factor. Whew, let me catch breath. In this episode, the camera is set way back from the center of the engineering set. The wild engine components are wheeled out and a vast amount of floor space is left open. This is one of two episodes, the Tholian web was the other, in which we see Uhura's quarters. Some African motifs are displayed. The sign on Uhura's door simply reads Lieutenant Uhura. In the scene where Kurt tries to teach Elon courtesy, Elon reacts behind the door, excuse me, she retreats behind the door in Uhura's quarters. That could be a bathroom, a room never seen on the original series. This room can be seen briefly in Mirror Mirror when Marlena enters it to change her clothes in The Conscience of the King, when the room is redressed as Caridian's quarters, and in By Any Other Name, when Rojan enters Kalinda's quarters to find Kirk apologizing to her. The steps leading up to the transport chamber were painted black for the third season. John Meredith Lucas was pleased with this episode, commenting, I enjoyed the love story aspect of the show and thought it was an interesting change of pace. You didn't get too many of those. Producer Fred Freeberger noted that the episode was intended to appeal to women who were skeptical of science fiction. He remarked, we tried to reach a segment of the audience we couldn't otherwise reach and didn't succeed. None's perfect. In Star Trek, the original series 365, authors Paula M. Block and Terry J. Erdman are scathing of this episode commenting that it was indicative of many, though not all, of the episodes produced for Star Trek's third season. Costumes, makeup, and script were all overblown, perhaps more suitable to sci-fi pulp than the, other, than the show's earlier attempts at straightforward storytelling in a unique setting. And finally, according to author Daniel Lombardi, Le Dannard Leonard Bernardi, Elon of Troyes brings into play stereotypes of the Asian female the manipulative dragon lady, and the submissive female slave. Elon is both irrational and primitive. She throws temper tantrums, eats with her hands, and drinks from the bottle. Kirk tells her, nobody's told you that you're an uncivilized savage, a vicious child in a woman's body, an arrogant monster. Bernardi, Bernardi argues Captain Kirk, the white knight of Star Trek, articulates his and the Federation's moral superiority and authority over the Asian alien and her people through sexual conquest. Indeed, it is only after the captain physically and sexually dominates her that she respects and eventually falls in love with him. After giving in to Kirk's power, Elon, like the cunning and manipulative dragon lady of classical Hollywood cinema, returns the favor by capturing his heart. The Asian alien's Tears contain a biochemical agent that, when touched by a man, even aliens like Kirk, forces him to fall deeply in love with her. After she manipulates Kirk into desiring her, Elon becomes submissive, gentle, loyal, even willing to die with him by his side as the Klingons ruthlessly attack the Enterprise. It is at this point in the narrative that the other stereotype of the Asian female comes into play, that of the submissive Asian slave. In the end, Elon does anything Captain Kirk requests, politely and adoringly obeying his demands and orders. Her Dragon Lady tactics were only used so that she could assume a position she truly desired, the submissive mistress of a white knight. I'm going to double check to make sure that was indeed the last bit. I think it was. But I am going to double check. I'm going to be responsible. That was indeed it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I've got here. Slam the wrist of this dude. Sl send it home. Pull the screen down a little. Ooh. It's dead, Jim. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for taking the time out to watch, watch this special entry. One where I honor and mention the Super Bowl. 
the Atlanta Falcons anyway. And I also want to take the time to thank you all for watching this, however you're doing it. It means a lot to me. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time again. Time to make like the Enterprise and warp out. So everybody take care. Have an awesome night or day. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, and if you do, name it after me. Don't drink and drive because you might spill your drink. More importantly, you might kill yourself or someone else. Drinking and driving is dumber than being a Twilight fan. And what's worse than that is rooting for cheating bastards like Tom. Giselle won't let me go to the Pro Bowl, and I'm scared the Falcons are going to knock me out. Brady, men slapping women, racism, animal abuse, fake friends, people who watch on bets, or anyone who's a member of, supports, or defends ISIS, the website Agony Booth, or the Westboro Baptist Church, who tried to picket Leonard Nimoy's funeral, but they couldn't get it done because they couldn't find it. Things like that are highly illogical, and I will not make time for them. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, I wish you all live long and prosper.